What's up guys, welcome back to the Broccoli Rose. Today we're talking all about seaweed. It's one of the most nutritious foods on the planet and here's what's coming up. We've really missed the role of seaweed in the world, both in terms of sustainability and importantly in human health. And when you're thinking that the gut is, you know, 30 square meters and it's 70% of our immune system, mm. Uh, and we're treating it like we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not surprising we're running into so many chronic diseases. Yep. Some of the seaweeds we work with, particularly, are very similar. They mimic nearly exactly our own human connective tissue. We're in fact printing new human tissue with our seaweed gels because human cells are actually recognizing that molecule and attaching to it as if it's its own. This is huge. It's literally a superfood. Yeah, yeah. On one hectare of farm, we could produce. 100 tonnes of dried seaweed. If you compare that to wheat, wheat would be about 5 tonnes in a year. So, so you're at 100 tonnes? Yeah. 20 times more efficient? Yes. Oh. Aquaculture is a sustainable solution. We don't have droughts, <laughs> we've got 70% oceans, it's a lot of space and, and it's a very clean, clean way to grow seafood if you do it in an ecologically sustainable way. But that's... It seems like every week a new superfood is found, a new property inside some foreign exotic fruit could save us all from cancer and fix all our gut health ailments. Now it's pretty rare that I get excited about these findings as most are often industry funded and skewed by the media with a largely commercial sway. But today I'm excited. In fact, I've been excited about this range of superfoods for a very long time. I'm sounding like a commercial, I know, but the, the reality is that seaweed, the reds, the greens, the browns, have huge implications for the global economy, our environment, and of course, our health. But with 99% of seaweed agriculture occurring in Eastern countries, it's still a food and topic I know very little about. I wanna change that. See, if you can picture yourself around in 1788, here in Australia, before the first fleet arrived and before they forced their own agricultural preferences onto this fragile country. Now, littering the entire countryside was native, organic, incredibly bioavailable, healthy superfoods. Think Australian wild rice, yams and other roots and tubers, berries, game meats and more. Now, lining the shores and filling the depths of the ocean was another food, offering what is really an exemplary nutritional profile. Seaweed. For the next 230 years, an English way of farming was forced onto this land and we had to pay the price for it with expensive and brutally toxic agrochemicals and fertilizers, many of which, by the way, end up in the ocean and all of which do nothing but harm to the fragile topsoil and ecosystem of the country. I want to see a new way of agriculture here in Australia, the huge plethora of indigenous foods available to be grown in much more controlled environments than before with modern urban farming techniques I believe could save us from our environmental woes and maintain a powerful connection with our Aboriginal heritage. I think the first place to start with a very conscious, ecologically friendly approach is in the ocean. Seaweed may be one of the least invasive forms of agriculture I've ever come across. It actively adds back, adds value back to the biological system in which it grows. On a global scale, seaweed has the potential to provide 10% of the world's food supply by 2050, whilst at the same time sequestering toxic byproducts of modern agriculture from the environment, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, whilst only using 0.03 of the ocean's surface area to do so. That's a tiny amount if spread across dozens of countries. Now, according to a seaweed agriculture global report by the World Bank Group, seaweed is an incredible source of omega-3 oils, protein, gut nourishing carbohydrates, soft fibers, it's antifungal, antibacterial, it's anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, anti-cancer, and may also regulate blood pressure and nourish the liver. Now to chat about the seemingly endless array of benefits which seaweed offers the world today, I have seaweed researcher Dr. Pia Weinberg joining me. She's a marine ecologist and founder of FICO Health, the company producing seaweed health products on the south coast of New South Wales. Let's jump into the interview now. Great. Dr. Pia Weinberg, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kale. I'm really excited to have you on. It's funny because I went surfing this morning. Yeah. And I saw some seaweed in the water and I was like, sweet. And I was telling someone out there, I was, I was like, oh, I've got this seaweed lady. <laughs> yeah. I've got this seaweed lady coming to the studio. <laughs> Is that how you consider yourself? <laughs> yeah, I get called the slimy lady, the seaweed lady. Yeah, that's sort of my, you know, my second name, I guess. Mm. And um, But it's it's a fast way for people to sort of 
get an initial grip and understand what it is I'm doing. Um, and so I'm happy for that too. You know, I'm pushing the cause for seaweed on a number of levels for sustainability and for health. Mm. And, um, and uh, you know, if seaweed lady is the best way to get the introduction <laughs> done, then that's the best way to do it. And people click, right, that's what yeah. she's about. Yeah. So when you write on the customs form, yeah. de departing form, what do you write on that form? Um, under occupation. Under occupation, I yeah, I say I say sometimes a, a scientist usually yeah. um, is what I get through. But um, I'm usually carrying bags of seaweed with me when I travel, <laughs> and and that always ask questions, you know. And I, I you know it. land in San Francisco airport, and they're like, "What's in this bag?" What's well, green it's like powder? Seaweed, yeah. And <laughs> yeah. It usually stumps people, mm. you know, because everyone knows what seaweed is, but it's really just not mainstream and it's not even mainstream in trade mm. it's sort of a non-prescribed good in in international trade and so people are just oh like whatever and let it through because um it's yeah it's it's new it's old but it's new and um but pe most people are positive to it and get well seaweed's harmless and good so yeah but you do get looks when you're carrying bags of <laughs> green stuff and I've even taken photos at airports where I'm walking there with actually literally dropping off a big yeah. green bag of green powder <laughs> and there's two policemen behind me and it's like well oh, they're not looking twice yeah, yeah. and mm. so are you a marine ecologist yeah marine by, by systems training? ecologist by training so yeah. 20 from Stockholm University 20 years ago it was all about the sustainability of the oceans and I just saw how aquaculture, there was a blue revolution, you know, last century mm. um, and aquaculture just accelerated and was the new frontier of feeding the world and helping people in developing countries get jobs and an income and something for them to do. But because it was so, grew so fast, mm. like many things, it made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and especially when it grows fast in developing countries where there's not regulations. Um, and so there were a lot of environmental impacts and that's where I first um, came into it because I, I know that you know seafood is such an important source of nutrition now today in the past and into the future um, but if we're reaching peak fish oil pretty much you know yeah. can't can't get those increase those wild capture fisheries aquaculture is a sustainable solution we don't have droughts <laughs> we've got 70 percent oceans it's a lot of space and and it's a very clean clean way to grow seafood if you do it in an ecologically sustainable way but that's that wasn't happening and so that's where seaweed came in it was actually the missing link mm. cleaning up the nutrients putting oxygen back in the water and making a nice ecosystem but uh, after 10 years of pushing that from a sustainability point of view I realized well People aren't buying the sustainability side of it. Yeah. <laughs> and so how do you, and so what else is seaweed used for? And then you raise a $10 billion global crop. And throughout Southeast Asia, it's regarded as one of the essential parts yeah. of their health. They yeah. eat for health there. And so seaweed is just a normal component of the diet there. And that's what um, I'm on a mission to do is make it just a normal part of our modern diet to address that corner of nutrition and health that's actually missing in the Western diet. I love it. So it's, it's incredible that you landed on seaweed so long ago because mm. personally I, um, I knew about seaweed. I, I had been into dulse flakes and yeah. all these different things from overseas. But after doing the gut movie and that whole experience, it was like, I've actually got to get in touch with my local ecology and find some local foods mm. because, you know, I have an indigenous background. I think it's really important that I honour that with... Um, sort of getting in touch with the food that we have here. So when I actually came back, one of the first things that I did was started learning about seaweeds and doing some seaweed foraging yeah, <laughs> on yeah. the beach whilst I was Great. surfing. And not particularly from a meal standpoint mm. or anything like that, but just going and eating some kelp mm. um, to get the microbes from the ocean and yeah. just to pick up different things here and there. Yeah. Is that where you started as well or, did, or were you just more in the lab? Oh, uh, well, no, definitely it was like uh, in the field, but it was in the field in Sri Lanka in, yeah. in the tiger prawn farms where they were farming these prawns and one of the farms had introduced a seaweed pond to start cleaning up the nutrients from the prawn farm. Mm. Um, and that's where I was measuring where the nutrients are going and how the ecosystem is balanced in that system. Um, and uh, yeah, I actually still have that first piece of seaweed that was pulled out of that pond and I pressed it in my research book oh, no. and I can still look back at it sometimes and go, yeah, that's where the journey started. Yeah. Um, and it's a piece of Gracilaria seaweed and, uh, and um, 
yeah, that was really when, it, uh, as an ecologist and a marine ecologist, it just sort of dawned on me that we really missed the role of seaweed in mm. the world, both in terms of sustainability and, importantly, in human health. We've just lost it. Yeah. It's You know, there's a lot of information that, um, and especially, you, you know, uh, indigenous lo- knowledge is being lost from indigenous culture because it's just not practiced as much anymore and transferred generation after generation. And the same things happened with the Western world. We've moved to um, new continents, industrialized those continents very rapidly and forgotten about the source of mm. food and nutrition. And seaweed just totally dropped off the radar. But it's coming back. It is coming back. And that's what's that's what's a bit weird. You sort of talk about it like it's new, but you're going, it's actually really old. Yeah. One of the oldest recognized forms of nutrition, you know, thousands of years BC, 13,000 years in Chile, the middens were loaded with seaweed remnants that people walked miles for to collect at the coast. And even mm. indigenous Australians have records of inland people trading and getting seaweed from the coast because it's got essential trace elements and nutrients it's that you don't get in land. Food. It's literally a superfood. Yeah, yeah. It's it's packed with yeah. <laughs> with everything that you lose from the land and the soil that ends up in the ocean and seaweed can actually concentrate and accumulate mm. a lot of those things and this and it's very unique and distinct from the land plants in terms of the other components that are there. They're very they're sort of they're they're the, they're where land plants evolved from mm. but there's um you know the gut health fibers and proteins like we our seaweed's got uh, 40% protein all the essential amino acids and b12 what land plant has that you know yeah Mm. so when you talk about and i want to touch on the sustainability aspect as well but from the fiber Mm. um, perspective from my understanding the difference in the fibers is because it's a softer fiber because it doesn't Mm. have to grow against gravity that's right you know land plants and trees here have to load themselves Mm. with the very hard to digest celluloses and lignans Um, to keep themselves upright Mm. against gravity and so a whole lot of the um, yeah carbohydrate component uh, there is sort of difficult for us to digest Um, and even grass is full of that that's why cows have to chew the cud for so long to try and digest that they've got three stomachs to do it and we don't have that so Mm. where the seaweed dietary fibers and seaweed fibers um, are there just to keep strength and flexibility connect the cells um, and some of the seaweeds we work with particularly are very similar. They mimic nearly exactly our own human connective tissue. We're a salty environment. They have to work. Our blood and everything is a salty environment for mm. our cells to live in. Yeah. And the ocean and the seaweeds are similarly salty and they have to deal with you know osmotic differences. And, um, and so there's a lot of similarities between seaweed uh, tissues and structures and, and components and even our own human ones but it's uh you know a, not even a plant it's it's algae yeah oh so it's not technically a plant no not technically yeah. it's a precursor to plants right. because yeah. um it's uh, it's an algae and, and seaweed yeah. is just algae glued together in multi multicellular components and the glue is actually the really exciting dietary fiber components yeah um, that make up about 40 to 50 percent of the seaweed. They're like a king of different yeah. types of dietary fiber. But you've been doing um, some research mm. on that, I believe. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you share with us? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well. Well. Um, well. First of all, it was a, a long journey to try and understand this dietary fiber components in seaweed. So some of them are already huge. You know, huge production systems. Uh, alginate, for example, is grown in China, and um, if you know the Gaviscon kind of gut relief uh, medicines that's what um that's what is al- that's alginate okay soothing yeah. your your irritations because it's um a nice smooth oh, kind of gel you know okay, gaviscon yeah, yeah like... i used to make a joke about that all right oh <laughs> i will tell it because i brought it up yeah? but someone used to come into the a cafe that i always used to go into and he'd be like did you hear about my friend gav yeah i can't believe gav is gone or something like that it was a horrible joke anyway please continue but that's an old it's an old i mean yeah it's so familiar to people that they used gaviscon but nobody really realized we well, are swallowing seaweed mucus yeah. so seaweed gels to soothe that lining and that's just a sort of physical lining soother like aloe vera Um, yeah a little bit like that except except because they're from the ocean they're highly sulfated and they've got different properties Mm -hmm. um uh, and um and so that's why you've got alginate in gaviscon but alginate in seaweeds is actually a gel to give strength and flexibility it's not a gel that communicates with other cells very much 
there's other seaweed components to the seaweeds and other gels that do that. So the whole world, and it's called glycobiology, uh -huh. there's a whole new world of uh, understanding gels. Um, you would have heard of like bone broth. Yeah. That's also gels. Like it's the gels from the connective tissue in the animals. And so there's this whole field of this connective tissue stuff is really important in human health. And that's, you could see the seaweeds and some of the gels we are extracting. It's like a vegetarian bone broth, if mm. you like. That's the kind of molecules they are. But try and understand which ones in which seaweeds doing what things, because they're all so different. Mm. And seaweeds are more diverse than land plants. So you actually have to learn a lot about, oh, this seaweed's got this gel, it's got this many negative charge mon molecules and these kind of sugars, so it'll feed those kinds of bacteria <laughs> and it'll link onto those immune cells in your gut lining and it'll communicate that way. And so it's um, a really exciting frontier that we're standing on the edge of, um, understanding this whole new world of how gels, different mm. kinds of gels, are actually so important to our health and we'll do very different things within the gut and learning about that. So you asked about what we've done yeah, particularly. Yeah, I was going to say what yeah. that looks like, like how you, mm. how do you find all this stuff out and what are you relying on and then how involved are you and yeah. Yeah, I want to know what you're up to. Well, yeah, <laughs> very involved and, and being a scientist now, I have to, I've had to like join the pieces of the puzzle because there were all these people doing work on seaweed gels from a seaweed point of view and sitting in their seaweed labs going wow there's very interesting chemistry going on here yeah and then there's all these nutritional people on the other side going oh we should be eating these sorts of things and what's that doing and learning about oh it's the gut you know and, and starting to try and understand that and what is it that's interacting with the gut and then you go oh these people are actually looking at gels in the gut kind mm. of thing and these people looking at the different gels but they don't understand each other and so putting those bits of knowledge together is really the space that I'm fitting in now. Mm. I'm having to go between different kinds and areas of, of science um, to create the picture and understand um, where we get our food from sustainably, um, how that goes into people and what benefits it has in, in what amounts and things as well. Um, and so we actually found one endemic Australian seaweed and we started to look at, well, how is this gel different to the other seaweed gels that we've got, like Gaviscon, for yeah. example? <laughs> um, how is it different? And we found that, wow, this seaweed gel's got sugars that look like our own connective tissue sugars. And, um, and it's got uh, sulfation. It means it's very negatively charged and that means it communicates intensively with cells, mm. it can block viruses. You know, viruses are one trigger to a lot of gut disruption um, and, and eating seaweeds continuously can actually help to just reduce the risk of having mm. a virus come in and disrupt things because that's sometimes a very difficult thing to undisrupt. Yeah. So talk, sorry mm. to interrupt you, when you talk about uh, conductivity, yeah, uh, I think that's the word you said. Yeah, um, sure. that, is that sort of saying how alkaline it is? Um, no, not really a, around okay. that because that's my, more the, the pH okay. and the acidity yeah. and the alkaline um, uh, ratio. This is that the molecule has a, a negative charge. So say if you've so got... it's like an antioxidant. It's very much an antioxidant, okay. yeah. yeah. But also the, the charge means it's... And the structures means it's actually got particular kind of keys that mm -hmm. link on to human cells. We're in fact printing new human tissue with our seaweed gels because human cells are actually recognizing that molecule and attaching to it as if it's its own. Wow. And so we're able to now grow tissue on these gels and, and, uh, and other things like collagen as well is something that um, binds and connects to these kinds of gels. The collagen in our skin and the gels that exist in um, are that's really what bone broth and things mm. are. It's it's collagen and the gels that surround it, um, and and uh, those are the types of molecules we're now trying to understand the the codes of and how they work in our body. So that's a complex way it's of huge of, it's implications. Huge. Though that's like yeah. it's massive, and it's very complicated. And I've probably yeah. made it sound complicated, no, but, but it's, it's good. <laughs> it's deep. I love it. It's well, I say it's actually a little bit like looking into space and the universe and going, "What's out there? How do we see it?" And we haven't been seeing these things. It's looking into the little universe and going, wow, there's these very tiny but big molecules we've been ignoring for so long. 
and they're probably the most abundant kind of you know category of molecule mm. of life on the planet and and we've ignored it um, and so it's just so exciting to be a part of that and but we can't overwhelm ourselves with trying to understand everything at once and we have to narrow down and that's what we've done with this one particular green seaweed and we went, wow, well, this actually should have some pretty interesting benefits mm. for the human digestive system. And that's sort of based on, funnily enough, you know, farmers and animal research in animal health. A lot of the science is saying seaweed is the solution for animals. And you see the people sitting there feeding the seaweed <laughs> yeah. to the animals, but the farmers sitting there no, eating Irish his hamburgers. <laughs> You're going, uh, yes. even the racehorse industry, they yeah. pile seaweed into the racehorses. It was huge money. Huge yeah, money. Yeah. And, and if the racehorses need seaweed <laughs> to be these kind of prime animals, yeah. doesn't it make sense that, you know, mm. that's the sort of thing we need to be to be racehorses as well? And, um, and uh, so that's what we're just learning that, well, all this knowledge we've put into animal health um, and avoiding antibiotics in animals even, they're putting it into the pork industry and swine to production to um, um, improve their gut and avoid having to use antibiotics all the time. In Europe now, um, they're banning in many countries antibiotics yeah. because of the gut issue in, yep, in animals. <laughs> but they're putting seaweed in instead because that's preventing the issues coming up in the first place. It's so exciting. Yeah. And so we've done that now with um, two human clinical studies mm-hmm. um, based on the premise that we can reverse some of the problems that have been set up in our um, Western guts. Um, so in the first study, we recruited um, about 60 people and we took them on being obese or overweight and probably a Mm pre-diabetic. And that was our initial focus. We're going to improve the glucose and insulin metabolism, hopefully reduce some cholesterol, and we'll also look at the inflammation. Um, And what we found after these people added about two to four grams of seaweed fibers in their diet every day, um, is one we reduce the cholesterol significantly um, and bad the infl- cholesterol. Bad cholesterol, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. The, and the good cholesterol stayed uh, even or 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 improved. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and um, and uh, and then inflammation, just the broad sort of chronic inflammation, which is known as C-reactive protein yep. or CRP, um, and came down in those two groups um, compared to the placebo and all blinded um, clinical mm-hmm. study. Um, and we also measured the fingerprint of their gut. So we yeah. took our fecal swabs yeah. and got the whole fingerprint before and after. And, and we're sort of going, all right, these gels should, one, affect sort of cholesterol and bile and things as it's in the gut, but it also will interact with the uh, lining of the intestinal system and immune cells and, and in that way may interact with the blood plasma and what's going into that. But also it may interact with the bacteria and their products, mm. and those will maybe also interact with the blood plasma. So it's very complicated because it could be doing something directly in the gut with the other foods and your other uh, and other metabolites, or it can be doing something with your gut lining, or it can be doing something with the bacteria that are doing something with your gut lining. Mm. Um, and so the picture and the mechanisms are not 100% clear yet, but we're definitely seeing that, uh, as we anticipated, the cholesterol is going down, inflammation is going down, and the gut flora is shifting. And the 15 gut flora that shifted, um, five of those were um, made a lot of sense mm-hmm. that they would shift. And there were things like acromancia, which is important for the um, mucus lining, bifidobacteria, yep. yeah, um, and and butyrate producers as well yeah. that protect the colon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and colon cancer is a big um, thing yeah, in, in our in our world as and well. And the immune system as well. Butyrate yeah. so so essential. Yeah, very essential. And yeah. when you're thinking that the gut is you know 30 square meters and it's 70 percent of our immune system, mm. uh, and we're treating it like we are. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not surprising we're running into so many chronic diseases yeah. and inflammatory ones. Mm. So you had bifidobacteria, acromantia, um, um, pseudobutyria vibrio, which oh. is butyrate, butyr, but, yeah. butyrate producing bacteria. And we didn't reduce any except one species dropped, and that was Bilophila, which is a bile eater. Okay. Uh, and that could be because we're actually binding bile in the digestive system. So you can, 
and that's being excreted more, that means that the bile in your liver is being, or the cholesterol in your liver is being used to, and turned into bile in because you don't have enough coming into, or have a lot coming into your bloodstream. Mm. Um, and, and that's why your cholesterol is being used um, and, and dropping because, yeah, you're actually turning the cholesterol into bile because um, that's what it's there for instead of overloading the bile in the system. So this seaweed can actually attach to um, and and transport bile out of your system, basically. It's mm. one of the one of these consistent things that I see with um, really powerful foods is mm. that they have a multifaceted mm. benefit on the entire body, yeah. not just one system. No, that's right. It's a it's a and it's it's nice to want to simplify things, mm. uh, and that's what I because I'm an ecologist and I'm like. I'm a complicated marine kind of ecologist. I work with complex communities, chemistry, how are they all interacting? Um, that's what I do. And, I, and so I embrace the complexity, but I also know, well, people want a bit of a simpler answer. It's difficult to see a complicated network picture of how things work. Um, and it, yeah, it's, it's challenged to say, to make things too simple mm. because then people latch onto it as it's this or that. Well, it's not, that's not that that simple and it actually depends on what your gut bacteria is when you start, um, what other foods you're eating, how you sleep, <laughs> how you work, um, and many things interact. And so it's not like, um, you know, the, the drug industry is based on take this drug, it'll do yeah. this or that. And that's not how health really works. No. It's a complicated ecosystem um, and that's the sort of complicated message you've got to simplify. But um, it's it's important to illustrate for people that there's a whole lot of complexity here going on. We understand, you know, really exciting amount of it, but it's probably this big. And embrace the complexity, see how things are working positively or negatively and go down the positive path with it. Um, but, um, but also no, it's, it's not black and white, eat this, that happens um, kind of as kind of a scenario mm. so yeah embrace complexity but and and <laughs> and also that's why you need diversity in your foods as well because even i mean if i said i love seaweed but i would never say to you live off live seaweed. off seaweed yeah. and yeah. that's the kind of thing that actually does happen you know you've you've seen people go avocados <laughs> are good for you and then they'll just eat avocados and you're going 30 no bananas a day. yeah <laughs> yeah no yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you don't need a lot of seaweed you know you need mm. about 10 grams and it'll give you so much of the trace elements and mm. dietary fibers and other things that you need that um, antioxidants it's loaded with. Um, so it's about putting it into a, a good balanced diet. And I also say to people as well, you know, we delivered it in a capsule in the study. Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to ask is how these yeah. people took it. Yeah. Yeah. Because as a double blind placebo controlled study, they're not to allowed to know what they're mm. eating. And we wanted to concentrate and focus on is the dietary fiber component of the seaweed, the mm -hmm. seaweed broth, if you like. <laughs> um, the um, we have we ex concentrated that component and encapsulated it, um, and it's better if you eat that in your food as yep. a food all the time. But if you're not eating it in, as a food, then like you know fish oil capsules, you're not getting enough omega three. Then you'll have to take it in a capsule. If you're not getting enough of the dietary fiber, then you know, sometimes you have to take it in a capsule. But it's a way towards, towards getting people to understand that this is the breadth of nutrients you need. Um, and let's start putting it into foods, preferably. Mm. Um, but if you're really missing it, and taking a taking a dose in a capsule can be a way a way to um, yeah, overcome it. Mm. Love it. You spoke about omega threes there. Yeah. You had some interesting stuff. Uh, we met at my gut movie screening down yeah. on the south coast, and you mentioned the. I think it was a study that was done in a prison. Yes. Can you please share that? Because that has some <laughs> huge um, implications attached to it. Oh, well, it does. So the um, uh, the premise, I mean, as I was saying, I work with marine nutritional sources and sustainable production of them. And that includes um, fish, invertebrates, because there's so many important components of ocean nutrition. Um, and omega-3 is a classic. I mean, fish oil is something that everybody's familiar with. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look back during the, the Cod Wars and a book that was written on that, you know, the British government during the war didn't have many fish and it brought back the cod liver oil from the north and fed it to its kids and they, they state, in the, in the government states in documents, the kids have never been as healthy as when they're being forced to eat um, a cod liver oil because yeah. omega-3 is essential um, for us. We can't 
we can't make the omega-3 um, that you get like in flaxseed and mm -hmm. things. So that's where flaxseed can actually give you the omega-3 that you have to have. You just can't make it, you have to eat it. And the things that make it are seaweeds and algae. Mm. And the fish that have it, they got it from the seaweeds and algae. It went up the food chain and they're concentrated in the fish because the fish can't make it either. Yeah. Um, and so flaxseed is, a, is an omega-3 that we can, we can eat, but it's an 18 carbon um, omega-3. It's called ALA. It's not the long chain, 20, you know, 25, 26 carbons uh, that's EPA and DHA that we have so in our brain cells. Is it alpha lipoic acid? Yes, alpha and, linoleic acid. Oh, linoleic acid, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then there's... Um, ecopentanoic acid. This is for the nerds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and docahexanoid acid, <laughs> DHA. You're a star. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you will see on the fish oil, they, they put their EPA, DHA, how yep. much is there. Mm -hmm. So when you eat flaxseed, you can actually start adding carbons to it and, and work it up to an EPA and a DHA. But that process is really limited. Mm -hmm. We can't do it a lot. Um, and it's the, and it's the anti-inflammatory pathway of our metabolism, uh, where the omega-6s are, are the pro-inflammatory pathway. And we need them both. We need, we need omega-3s and omega-6s to do, do anti-inflammatory and pro-inflammatory. And yeah. pro but the ratio that we're eating in our Western <laughs> off, diet right? yeah. is 15 pro-inflammatories to one anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Mm. So we are so wrongly balanced. And what's balanced. the ideal? I've heard one to one is actually the ideal, but I don't know. What's your sort of take on Two it? Two to one to one to okay. one, yeah. yeah. But we definitely need we're to at increase. 15. Yeah, we're at 15. It's <laughs> an issue. <laughs> yeah. So... You can eat your flaxseed, um, but a, and they say omega three. It is an omega three, but it's got to work its way up to those it's long like a chain. Pre -omega -3. It's a yeah. pre omega three. It's a pre omega three. It's an omega three, but it's a short omega three. Okay. Yep. And you need the long ones because the grey matter of your brain, and this is where the jail study came in. The grey matter of your brain is um, overrepresented, if you like, by the long chain. Um, omega-3s, mm -hmm. EPA and DHA. And why? It's, it's the cell membrane of, of your brain cells that, um, that uses these. And the, cell mem the DHA and EPA make your cell membrane really fluid and able to communicate rapidly. Mm -hmm. That's why they're in cold fish, oily fish, because otherwise they freeze like butter. Yeah. And so these, these um, omega-3s help keep the salmon and the sardines fluid and liquid yeah. in those cold waters. Um, and that's why they're the richest sources of these types of omega-3s. And the same way in your brain, you don't want your brain to freeze, like literally into butter. <laughs> oh, so. I've had some brain freezes lately, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the water's getting cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you'll need omega-3 to cope with that. Yep. Um, and, uh, and because we just don't get enough of that omega-3 and we can't make it, your brain grey matter is being replaced by other lipids mm. uh, and so it's not firing the signals as quickly as it should and that's n logical and and uh, in a scientific way you know the theory makes sense but to actually then see it um, have uh, an impact somewhere is really what still astounds me you just go oh, wow this is logical and then you go oh wow it actually <laughs> happened we were interested to see in Oxford University um, uh, a study in the prisons supplemented fish oil and reduced the aggression, aggressive incidents in the prison by 35%. We went, it's yeah. really that measurable? So you they know? used f uh, fish oil? Fish Sorry. oil. Fish oil, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so what we did then is um, I collaborate very closely with um, Omega-3, uh, a professor at the University of Wollongong, and we proposed to go into a South Coast Correctional Centre and um, that takes a lot of <laughs> protocols to get I'm through. Sure. I think with only yeah. people allowed in that centre with needles and, dr and pills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, and uh, we actually measured the omega-3 profile in their blood. And then we got psych uh, clinical, clinical psycho psychologists in with us mm -hmm. um, to work on how do we measure their aggression. And we used different scores. We used... Um, um, aggression and impulsivity tests and we also measured aggressive incidents in the prison so the prison guards were measuring yep. the incidents um, and we correlated significantly the level of omega-3 in their blood the higher it was the lower aggression wow. yeah and now that study's been funded to expand to five prisons 
because you just imagine a lot of these people it's not just the omega-3 it's mm. their life lifelong nutrition mm. and if their lifelong nutrition is one of the causative factors of why they're sitting in yeah. prison and if they're trying to put educational programs in but their brains are not working properly it's so important that this is one of the one of the aspects that these people have been missing all their life mm. and we need to start putting it back um, and so omega-3 is essential for the brain, uh, anti-inflammatory pathways, and, um, and uh, some people are just not getting it. Maybe we can achieve world peace with a bit more C- yeah. <laughs> omega-3s in the diet. Oh, man, mm. that's huge. So seaweed has a comparable omega-3 content to oily fish? Um, well, that's the thing. It's not very fatty. It's not very yeah. oily. So some microalgae mm-hmm. are, can be a little bit oily. Yeah. Um, but as I was saying, it, it actually bioaccumulates yeah. in the fish. So we have about five percent oils in our seaweed, okay. which is yeah. not a lot. Yeah. And about um, and about one percent of the seaweed is these omega threes. And yeah. our seaweed in particular, we've spent a lot of time measuring the omega-3 and omega-6 ratios. And we can actually now in our cultivation, we know if our seaweed's well fed under these conditions, uh, its omega-3 profile is maybe four times higher than its omega-6. Yeah. Um, and that's we know that that's the crop we want to harvest <laughs> yeah. because that's the crop that's going to start to shift the balance. And I had a PhD student work in Victoria with abalone and as a surfer, you'd like abalone probably. Yeah, I know it. No? <laughs> no. Well, growing up in South Australia, I was yeah. too scared to go abalone diving. Yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> For some... obvious reasons. <laughs> Sharks, guys. <laughs> there's some big fish um, out there. Yeah. But, um, but abalone are now farmed, but eating sort of cornflakes or pellets, if you yes. like, from land crops. I've heard this. Okay, this is a major issue across all agriculture. Yeah, because they're eating it. And omega-6 is good. It's, again, you can't say, you know, Wheat has done some, some, you know, given us some struggles, but it's not wheat itself. It's that we've overdosed on a refined component of the wheat. And it could be the glyphosate. <laughs> <sprayed on> it. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, it's not that simple. Um, and, but, um, so the Amiga, but the abalone are not designed to eat land crops. Mm. Or even chicken protein no, sometimes. Of they're, in their ocean <laughs> they're ocean yeah. animals. So we turned uh, abalone that were farmed back into seafood by feeding them seaweed mm. again and adding that to their diet instead yeah. of um, instead of the um, just the land-based omega C rich foods, uh, and um, and the same thing can happen to us. But it's important that these omega threes are introduced throughout our food chain because it's the abalone, it's even the grain-fed cattle, yeah. it's even the chickens and the pigs, and we're all eating omega sixes. And so it's not just us that needs to change our diet to omega-3 rich diets it's the animals as well because we're eating omega-6s mm. through them um, and so uh, that's why seaweed will be an important part of both the animal diets and accumulating omega-3s into them uh, at the same time as in ourselves and and it's about accumulating it throughout the whole food chain you could you'd have to eat an awful lot of our seaweed to get the same dose that a sardine would yeah, give you yeah um, and therefore, sardines and that kind of seafood are a pretty important thing to yeah. eat, eat oh, regularly. I love sardines. Yeah, well, yep, they'll keep your brain and heart and yeah. <laughs> anti-inflammatory pathways in shape. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's give everyone a short break and we'll jump to a little Sunday soliloquy and then continue on the seaweed discussion. Great. Sunday soliloquy here. Uh, when I was in Europe, I realized something pretty important, and that is how you eat and who you eat with is just as important as what you eat. I think here in the West, I guess, or in wherever, anywhere else but Europe, we're so obsessed with eating healthy now that I think it's actually become a little bit unhealthy. You know, we'd rather sit alone in the corner sipping our green smoothies, being upset at missing out, than enjoying whole foods, even though they don't fit under the paleo umbrella, but doing so with friends and family and with a red wine and chatting and eating slow and and being happy, you know. I think I'm starting to really question 
uh, this whole idea of health and wellness from a strictly dietary standpoint. And of course, we know that emotions and whatnot are so so important. But like I said before, how you eat and who you eat with, I'm actually now beginning to give as much weight as what I'm eating. So whether that's bringing people over more often and socialising and and having fun in that way and, and enjoying a red wine, organic preservative free of course, <laughs> um, over uh, with dinner and, and really focusing on eating slowly and mindfully, I think it's having a big impact on me and it seems to have a flow on effect to the rest of my life, not just around meals, like work time and starting to feel uh, excited about waking up early again and meditating and stretching and doing all these things. I don't know where that's come from, but there was a long time there. I just didn't feel like doing that. So I feel like this sort of longer duration, slower pace, uh, more sustainable pace at which I'm now approaching my health and wellness is really paying off in a big way. Hey guys, thanks for tuning into the show. I'm really excited to partner up with Dr. Pierre Winberg's company, FICO Health, producing some of the best quality seaweed products from around the world right here in Australia. And you can get your first sample of the products over at nicelife.com.au. And if you want to save on your first order, get $10 off or free shipping, just enter the discount code Broccoli Roast. Okay, guys, welcome back. I want to touch on the sustainability aspect. This is something very important to me. Um, I spoke about in the introduction, uh, b before we started recording, the drastic implications of using seaweed as a major crop. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think the numbers are we only need to use 0.03% of the ocean's uh, area, surface area, mm. to actually grow... A huge amount. Yeah. I can't remember what the actual amount and, is. And sequester carbon dioxide and turn that around. And do all these things, yeah. yeah. So, mm. I mean, how are you guys mm. producing? And actually, we, we've actually got to premise this and say that you've got your own sort of farm as yeah. well going on down there. So I want to know how you guys grow it, mm. where you see it going when you inevitably have to expand. Yeah. Well, seaweed's um, got a great... It is a $10 billion global crop, yeah. but it's mostly grown in Asia. Is it 97% or something in, in the eastern in the eastern countries or something? Yes, like exactly. It's, yeah. a, it's in the, it's in the uh, Asia. China took on... I mean, Japan was the first nation to start mm. seaweed farming back in the 1940s. And that was with the nori that we now have on our supermarket shelves. That was the first farming. Um, and uh, it, was, it was unlocked, actually, by a... A female scientist in Britain in the mm. 1940s called, called Kathleen Drew Baker and the Japanese have a national day celebrating Kathleen oh, Drew great. Baker <laughs> because she unlocked how they reproduce they've got a tricky tricky um, tricky sex life in seaweeds <laughs> and um, and so the Japanese uh, started that um, uh, back then and it's only now that it's mainstream on our supermarket shelves you know, this is a less than a hundred year old farming industry mm. then China realized Oh wow, we're very deficient in iodine, and so they grew an iodine-rich seaweed and became a massive producer of seaweed. Um, the Southeast Asians, uh, Philippines, and Indonesia are growing red seaweeds now that um, for carrageenan production, and um, uh, yeah, it's really ex um, taken over a lot of those countries. Korea, it's a main major part of their food, and um, and uh, yeah, it's just been. Uh, ignored in the West and forgotten. I mean, the, the English and the Irish used to have uh, lava bread. That, that's, a nori, that's a nori species okay. in lava bread, yeah. um, and they're not eating that much anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, they really didn't embrace um, the opportunity to farm and bring the nutrition with them um, from seaweeds. Um, but uh, most of the farming's based in the oceans. Mm. It's on a little bit like mussels, I guess, but yep. it has to be more closer to the surface because it needs the light. Yes. Um, and uh, and these big farms are at sea um, and growing the seaweeds at the whim and fancy of the currents and the kind of yeah. water that comes to them. And because seaweeds can hold trace elements so well, it's important that you're growing them in very clean waters. Yes. Because mm. you can accumulate metals and things yep. in them if you don't do that. 
Um, and that's where Australia's got a great opportunity because we do have yeah. an amazing continent coastline yeah. um, uh, girt by sea and we could do sea-based farming. But it's a little bit like any land farming. You know, the local farmer will know these carrots are grown in the soil and this is how you grow them and that's not how you grow bananas. You grow <laughs> bananas a very different way. Yeah. And so it depends on the seaweed. And there's many different types of seaweeds. There's more types of seaweed than there are plants nearly. Yeah. Um, and so some seaweeds are better grown in, in big pools and, and holding bays. And that's how we grow ours. Uh, because we have a small and we have a green one. We're introducing green seaweed to the world, really. Because uh, red nori, brown wakami and kombu, mm -hmm. those are now big in the world. And the green seaweeds have so much potential, but actually haven't been scaled up. And we have unique Australian species that we can work with. I love it that you're using native species, by mm. the way. I think that's a big tick. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's essential both yeah. for, um, yeah, one, it's a great thing for the unique potential in Australia, mm. but it's also um, uh, important from an ecosystem point of view that you're not introducing new species. Yeah. And that's actually happened when people put the wrong seaweed in the wrong place. Some, going, some seaweeds are going to Africa and becoming a bit of a pest. Really? It's like our gum trees yeah, don't really say, belong in California. I was going to say in Africa, <laughs> in Cape, around Cape Town and stuff, you see gum trees like just popping yeah. up everywhere. Yeah. yeah. And so seaweeds could do the same thing. So mm. it's important that we look at our own backyard and the opportunities. So much biodiversity here. Um, to embrace in seaweeds and very unique to Australia. So we're um, yeah, growing this unique Australian green seaweed and because we uh, want to control and maintain good omega-3 profiles, um, good protein content mm -hmm. and the trace element profiles, um, we're actually controlling the production in big swimming pools, yeah, basically. So you can control the environment. Yep. Yeah, So we and we also can then recycle nutrients that coming that are coming from food processing industries already, just mm. like a a compost juice, if you like, um, and uh, they're dissolved nutrients coming from land food processing, and we can then put them back, and the seaweed will take them up, add them to the trace elements from the seawater that we pump in, and presto, add a bit of sun, you've wow. got a, a nice seaweed blend, um, and we also are capturing carbon dioxide from a distillery, mm -hmm. so that um, the the growth is also very fast so it's about on one hectare of farm we could produce a hundred tons of dried seaweed That's dried too dried, so taking out the water a thousand yeah. times wet if yeah. we did it wet but a hundred tons of dried seaweed if you compare that to wheat wheat would be about five tons in a year so, so you're at a hundred tons yeah 20 times more efficient yes <sighs> Plus you're sequestering carbon dioxide you're not using pesticides or no, nothing it's all natural and we don't have droughts this is huge. Yeah, it's very huge. And it should be a new crop for Australia. And that's the message that you're trying yeah. slowly to get across to people. But but part of that message is, yeah, okay, from a sustainability point of, point of view, it just makes sense, totally. Mm. But it doesn't taste like Tim Tams. And that's what people <laughs> are used to eating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, getting used to a new flavor or learning, above all, learning how to incorporate it. Mm into foods in the right flavor balance you know people eat it straight and go oh that doesn't taste too good but yeah. you know do you eat garlic straight yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> no you don't i do so. but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. another story <laughs> no, many people wouldn't and so that's the point is we have to just learn how to put it back into food every day all the time mm -hmm. and it won't be difficult to eat seaweed if we yeah. do that okay so here's what i do i sprinkle golden kelp flakes yep. all over my roasted veg every single day. Yep. I'll have that. That's great. Yeah. What's another way that people can bring it into their into their diets? How have you done it? Uh, well, we've incorporated our seaweed into the one food that people eat most nights of the week uh -huh. in Australia. The dish is spaghetti bolognese yeah it's that's the reality people eat spaghetti bolognese most nights of the week ever, yeah. throughout the year in australia the, the people watching and listening may not eat too much pasta they may that's not fine. but <laughs> that's the main dish yeah. in uh -huh. australia yeah. yeah look at the stats and what are we trying to do here we're trying to change yeah. population scale yeah. diets um and i say it's it's great if we can you know all the foodie people who and the nutritional people and mm. the chef people <laughs> 
They're already there. <laughs> They're already there. Yeah. I don't need to pay yeah. too much attention yeah. to them, and it, and um and they and they get it. Mm. Um, but if we have, if we wanted, if we all wanted to eat that way overnight in Australia, if the whole of Australia made a decision tomorrow, I'm going to wake up and eat a really healthy, perfect diet, mm. it would be logistically impossible. Yeah, because you don't have enough food and all that sort of stuff. We don't have the balance of yeah. all the nutrients and the foods to do that. Yeah. So this is about uh, putting and injecting that nutritional. Mm. Um, concentrated opportunity back into mainstream foods and that's why we've introduced it um, 10% into pasta yeah 10% in, you know kids snack this kids are still eating chips at school for their school lunch yeah okay come on here's a corn chip with 10% seaweed in it yeah your child will get the trace elements it'll get gut fibers mm. Do it that way, please. Yeah. Um, and and the kids are loving it. Slowly they're starting to bring nori snacks into their school school snacks at lunches. You know, kids are loving those little nori, nori snacks. Unfortunately, they're packed in masses of plastic. But, <laughs> but if, we can, if we can bring in the things that, that make a change to people like that, that's one of our strategies because we have to make a change on a big scale. Um, because we're talking about global health people in prison because yeah. they haven't eaten right you know this is this is a population scale picture we're talking about um, and the people that understand the food and nutrition are really important in leading the way and, and showing that um, mm. they can do this so those kind for those kinds of people um we put it into some more exciting foods we've got like a beautiful ducker condiment that's I got saw a, that mm. oh, it looks beautiful yeah it's 10 percent seaweed and it's a uh, it's got a gold medal at the Australian Food Awards. It oh, was invented it. by my 16-year-old daughter. Oh, congratulations! <laughs> yeah, and um, and uh, it's it's great. And mm. and people who love the exotic and exciting complex foods, um, fantastic for them. But even I say to the families at the markets, and there's an old guy there who likes his bangers and mash. I just say to the wife. <laughs> Just pour these into his mashed potatoes. Yeah. And he'll love it. And he actually, they actually do. It tastes fantastic mm. in a mashed potatoes, and and uh, and get him to eat so it this that is way. Just some some the ducker blend. The ducker. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, if it's got a nice a balance with cumin, yeah. pistachio nuts, and and things like that, and um uh, and you'd be surprised that sometimes if you tell them it's seaweed, but if they taste it directly. Mm. I haven't found many people yet that don't like that ducker yeah, blend, yeah. and it's so easy then to get it into your into your foods every day. Mash avocado on toast in your morning—that's a main breakfast yeah. as well for many people. And pour the ducker blend with yeah. the ten percent oh, seaweed beautiful. on it. You can you can lash it on. It's yeah. and um, and uh, and get your dose that way. And that's the point: is you may eat sushi at lunchtime once a fortnight or mm. something, but that's not going to do much for you in terms of what seaweed can offer. Uh, you should be looking at where can I put it every day. So we put in muesli blends as yeah, well, yeah. Um, and um, and you've got um, supplement forms as well, like capsules. We do the capsules yeah. as well because that's about if people again like omega three. If you eat fish three or four times a week, mm -hmm. you don't need to take omega three yeah. capsules at all. Yeah. Most of your nutrition should come, all of your nutrition should come from your food. Yeah. What's the reality though? No, it's not. And as I said, if everyone wanted to eat right tomorrow, it's not possible. Yeah. So. It's important that we have to put back that concentrated bit of nutrition um, where it's vital and missing. Yeah. And there's many supplements that are actually not essential and not missing <laughs> in the Western world. Yeah. Um, but there are certain components that definitely are. Um, and some trace elements like iron and iodine are some of those. Um, the dietary fibers and the omega threes. Those mm. are you know critical things that are limited in many people's diets. And just putting the seaweed back in can turn that around. Mm. And are you a, are you a fan of doing some wild harvesting? A bit of wild harvesting. Seaweed? Wild harvesting seaweed's great. Yeah. Um, you're you're in you know, New South Wales and different states have different rules. You can harvest yeah. um, about um, twenty kilos a day. That's washed up on the beach, not yeah. not cutting it for mm. personal use. Yeah. If it's clean then you can use it for food. If it's been lying on the beach for a week, yeah. <laughs> I would put it in the compost and yeah. give it to your plants yeah. instead. Um, but, um, but the issue with Australia is um, our east coast current comes mm. down from the Great Barrier Reef. That's the Nemo current. Um, and it's not got a lot of nutrient the EAC. in it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, um, it's not full of nutrients because okay. coral reefs don't have nutrient rich water. They recycle very quickly mm -hmm. a small amount of nutrients. And so it's not like the North Atlantic with giant kelp forests yeah. or even Tasmania where I've just been giant kelp forests. There's not a lot of, there's huge diversity of seaweeds, but not a lot of biomass. Okay. 
And so we can't actually scale up. And if everyone started pillaging the shoreline of seaweed, <laughs> it wouldn't be nice for yeah. the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where um, harvesting uh, is really important for a social, cultural, um, culinary experience. Um, but it's not going to inject the nutrition we need at the population yeah. scale. Mm. And the most sustainable way is to farm, um, as I said, 100 tons on a hectare. That's huge, yeah. And, and feed a lot more people their nutrients mm. from a smaller amount of land. Well, I guess this is the way agriculture is going in general because mm. urban farming is, is going to become a thing. I think we're going to start to see... You know, literally, shipping containers filled with little mm. lettuces and stuff. You know, it's just not going to be possible to feed everyone the way we're going. No. Well, certainly, it's the same with most wild harvesting. Yeah. Is that if if everybody did it, it would not be sustainable. Well, that's right, and that's where we spoke about fisheries earlier and reaching peak fish oil. We have pretty good fisheries management practices in Australia, and it's lovely um, to catch your fish, and, but we can't catch more fish in the yeah. wild. It's we've overfished yeah um, and that's where aquaculture will come into place to to feed that population and that's this that's the struggle and the balance we have mm. it would be lovely if we could all have our cottage gardens and forage and collect um, but the impact if everyone did it would be massive yeah would devastate the coastline mm. so we have to um, farm the seaweed yeah I love it where do you sort of see this going if we do if people do bring this on board mm. and we start to see sort of a more widespread application of, of seaweed agriculture. What's it going to look like? It'll be diverse. Yeah. And, um, and you know, there's even been early experiments about some of the saline affected inland areas where there's salty water and nothing's growing mm. uh, about growing seaweed there. And I've said, yep, there's a great future opportunity to remediate and work with some of those land areas. Um, but let's not run before we can walk maybe yeah. and work on the coastline with the seawater that we know seaweed likes and inland there's more minerals and things you've got to balance so we could get there so in the future we could even have inland production of seaweeds in saline affected areas um, but in the immediate um, term i've just come back from tasmania and hobart um, and there's a great effort down there now to start uh, increasing seaweed production because mm -hmm. of course they've developed um, a fantastic salmon industry that's feeding a lot of Australia, yeah. their omega-3, but yeah. um, uh, they do, do have some of the uh, historical legacy of salmon farming, um, which is uh, overloading nutrients into the coastline and you know, management practices need yeah. to be optimal and, and well maintained. It's an ecosystem still. Mm. We've got to create permaculture in the sea, not monoculture in the sea. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so now looking at growing the seaweed around salmon farms so that you can take up the nutrients, mm. take up the carbon dioxide the salmon are breathing, put back the oxygen. Um, and you know ocean acidification is happening because of the overloading of CO2. But um, if seaweed's grown, it can actually capture that CO2 and buffer and alkalize yeah. the oceans. Um, and you can actually measure that. With the seaweed around salmon farms, you can measure that fish would acidify the ocean and seaweeds will alkalize the oceans yeah. and, and, um, and that we need the balance between the both of them. Mm. Oh, I love it. Let's answer a viewer question because oh. I, I put out um, a little thing in my in my Facebook group, Gut Nourishes, which you guys can join for free on Facebook. The question is, um, Emily from WA, uh, Emily, you've won, I can't remember what we're giving away. <laughs> it's an uh, online pass to the Gut Healing series, I think. Uh, anyway, I'll get in touch. Um, she asks, I have Hashimoto's disease, and I've heard mm. that seaweed is inappropriate with this condition. Is this true? Yeah, Hashimoto's disease is linked to the thyroid, and, and um, uh, thyroid is essential to our hormone system, um, and, and iodine is, mm. is an essential part of that. And Hashimoto's disease and other thyroid disorders um, are complicated, and that's indeed what I was saying before. China 
knew about that thousands of years ago and that's why they consciously started seaweed farming to put the iodine back into everybody's diet from the beginning mm -hmm. if you, you you can actually if you're not getting enough iodine throughout your life um, you may become um, sensitive to uh, increases in iodine and metabolizing iodine some people most people can urinate out the iodine that's in excess um, but some people can't yeah um, and uh, and if also people with a lifelong deficiency of iodine end up with thyroid disorders as well so um, it seems odd though then if they're short on iodine mm. shouldn't they have more iodine they, sh they should be throughout should. life, yes. But yeah. if you've had, sh if you've been short on iodine for mm. your whole life, um, you can you can then end up with a thyroid disorders that mean you be, so you're sensitive to iodine. You're sensitive. To um, it. Yeah. And and uh, but some and some people are more sensitive naturally, and but most of us can urinate iodine out. The problem with iodine is, you only need such trace, trace, trace amounts of it. It is so essential. Mm. It is. Um, it is considered to be um, one of the leading deficiency is considered mm. to be one of the leading forms of brain damage yeah and right. the world health organization says it's, it's so easy add some iodine yeah and uh, we will overcome the majority of you know brain disease uh, um, mm. and brain brain developmental health so effectively in your whole life as a trace element you need um, one teaspoon of iodine for mm. your whole life but you just need it all the time, every day, in little bits. Yeah. Um, and if you overdose it and you don't have a metabolism that can um, eliminate iodine from your system, then you actually end up with being um, hypermetabolic sort of and you're burning, you actually lose a lot of weight and, and it's, yeah. um, you, you're on a hyperdrive. Um, it, that's not good okay. um, and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so um, people that are sensitive to iodine uh, have, to be, have to restrict that a lot. So be, you end up with three categories. You end up with people who are just so deficient on iodine they're not learn to handle it anymore. But, um, but usually increasing iodine will help people throughout from childhood brain development and throughout life um, you've got to make sure that you're using iodine so that you prevent the onset of thyroid problems mm. um, that lead to you becoming sensitive or imbalanced in your hormonal system and, and it's really easy you don't have to buy iodized salt just get a bit of your golden kelp yeah. and use it as just that salty condiment just yeah. that will give you enough iodine um, throughout life but if you've even had an operation to remove your thyroid well then iodine is not going to help you anymore mm. because you've actually taken away that capacity for hormone processing and will have to replace that in other yeah. in other ways so if you've had your thyroid removed then that's it can't help you anymore yeah. <laughs> iodine's not going to do do the job it needs to do um, but um, otherwise everybody should start to look at increasing iodine in their diet um, very carefully in small amounts um, but if you are sensitive to it yeah that's that's a problem and it does yeah. need to be uh, limited so if you do have Hashimoto's does that sort of mean that you are inherently sensitive to iodine yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. and it's a, and it's a balance you both you both need it and you're sensitive to yeah. it yeah so you so sort you of got to find and and yeah. also and having it in those in those very minor amounts so that mm. that was an issue that emerged with seaweed and that's why again why I was in Tasmania um, this week is about naming seaweeds correctly yeah so um, a seaweed that is not good for people who are sensitive to iodine uh, is kombu kombu is loaded with iodine mm -hmm. and that's why they're growing it in China because their soils are depleted from iodine and they need iodine so they're growing this seaweed a sprinkle over it on your salt is a is a great way mm. um, to get the iodine from it but if you're sensitive um, it's too much and one food company um, processed uh, kelp into soy milk and not really understanding seaweeds and how much iodine there is in kombu. This is kombu, or yeah. one particular type of seaweed, and made many people sick because yeah. it overdosed the iodine and they were sensitive to the iodine. Um, but that's why we're working with the green seaweeds and that's something that's um, much better for people who are sensitive to iodine because we have traces of iodine, but it's so much lower than what it is in kombu. So that means we can put 10 grams or 10% of seaweed in our in our food products, in our Ducca blend, <laughs> and and you're still well under the, the yeah. safety limit of iodine each mm. day with the with the green seaweeds. The nori is pretty good too, but the brown kelps tend to accumulate um, yeah. iodine a lot, and that's where we have to learn 
again in the yeah. West. Seaweed ain't seaweed. Yeah. <laughs> Kombu is great to put as a salt uh, condiment and, and just eat little, little, little bits of it. But the green seaweeds, you can eat lots more of those and build up your gut flora and get the iron and all the other trace elements from it. Um, and nori is similar in that way as well. So we've got to learn a lot. We know that we can eat green bananas for resistant starch is something that people have recently learnt and mm. we know we can eat blueberries for their antioxidant status and so these are the sort of things we need to start looking at with seaweeds and becoming familiar with the names of them that's why we had the naming convention in Tasmania because people just go seaweed and yeah go, seaweed seaweed yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm. I love it yeah where can people find out more about you it's been an amazing conversation <laughs> love it I'm so excited it's such a uh, I'm very passionate about this topic and I'm yeah. really fortunate to learn from you. Well, I've become passionate about, about seaweed and where it fits in the world from mm. the environment on a global scale to the person and their internal gut. And so my, my vision is, you know, global ecology down to microecology in the human, in the human gut and their yeah. metabolism. Um, and so I span this grey zone of <laughs> I am an academic at the University of Wollongong uh, an honorary fellow there at the School of Medicine and still have students and collaborate and working with the next frontier of what we don't know about seaweeds. And so a lot of um, my scientific research is published online through the university and academic um, journals. And, and I've even worked with Australian government on a, the last 10 years, a series of reports about seaweed strategically 10 years ago, looking at is this something for Australia to look at? What species would we look at? What are they for? Um, how do they work in a human and where do we grow them and it's been a 10 year journey of, of working that out and to get to the point where I am now stepping outside of academia because you can write about it yeah. but that's not going to put seaweed on anyone's plate Yeah. and that's where I've had to create I said like well who's going to do it like you can, in science you go they should be doing this and it's mm. who's doing it yeah. so I, you actually have to step out and create create that and, and do that yourself yeah. um, and, and be on the journey for the long, time, long term so that um, you can address all the issues that come up as a new industry emerges and explaining to people how it works. Like I can't, I can't just give somebody a book and say, oh, this is how I grow seaweed and under, they will understand all the chemistry and the biology <laughs> and what the seaweed's liking and, yeah. and, and you actually have to be out there and part of the startup journey. So. Um, uh, we now have both the university kind of world that I live in and the startup world. And uh, we're incubated as an early stage company at the universities. Um, I accelerate uh, incubator with other startup cool. companies. Mm -hmm. And we're also linking into other incubators um, in the US and in Europe mm -hmm. um, and working with coll collaborators on a global scale in Western countries because we're the ones that have to learn the, the Asian countries are already there. Um, um, and uh, yeah, growing our company and the products and the markets. And next week's exciting because we'll be a flavor of New South Wales nice. at the Fine Food Show. Um, and uh, that's in part not just teaching your audience out here who gets it, but the retailers. Yeah. Because they go, hmm, seaweed? Mm, yeah. Some of them are starting to get it. But in the beginning, it was like, mm, I don't want seaweed. And now it's like, oh, yeah, I've heard seaweed's really good. Where can I get it? And we'll be there to show them, well, here it is. You can start selling it to your consumers. And that's what you need to be doing is asking yeah. the retailers to say, because these are the kinds of events that determine what goes on the supermarket shelf mm. and then ultimately what goes on everybody's plates. Yeah. It's what the retailers are, are looking at and deciding to buy. And it's a communication process from us as scientists to the consumer who drives the demand to the retailer and says, this is how we want our food. We want it nutritious, sustainable uh, and Australian. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and can you please supply us this through your shops? Mm. We try and do it e-commerce as well, mm. but, um, but people go, where can I buy my pasta locally? You yeah, know? okay. Mm. Yeah. Well, we might have to have a chat about doing some wholesale stuff. Yeah, so absolutely. We've got, a, we've got our, the gut health store. Yeah. So perhaps, yeah, we can have a chat about that. But uh, thanks so much for joining me. Yeah, on, no, great, Cal. It's been um, very nice having you. Thank you for communicating the journey and the science to everyone. It's really important. See you guys. Ooh.
thank you once again, everybody, for tuning in to this episode of The Broccoli Roast. As always, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Let me know in the comments what else you'd like to see on the show. Who should we get? What should we do? Also, let me know on socials. Guys, also check out nicelife.com.au, the Gut Health Store's website, where you can find all the best seaweed superfood products. Have a fantastic week. I'll see you guys very soon. Ciao.